And it's my hope that as we, as we dig through a lot today, that we are gonna see some things that we're called to do good and doing good is a big part of our mission here on earth. And part of that doing good means for the sake of Christ, we're on a mission through submission. And we're gonna submit in the world around non-Christians. We're gonna submit in the world under the government. We're gonna submit at home servants to unbelieving masters or bad leaders and wives and husbands. What does that submission look like? Good morning, so glad you guys are here. Welcome, we made it to Sunday, November 10th. Uh, this is a big election week and God was in charge before then, God's still in charge now. And in his providence, he put us right here in 1 Peter chapter two this week. Um, you're not gonna believe me, but originally this was supposed to be two weeks ago. And then if we had it Lev's way, this sermon would actually be coming up in end of February, I think. <laughs> But, and that's, when, once we get into it, you're going to be like, man, I feel like it's almost February because we have a lot to cover. But before we dive into the politics side of things, I thought I'd take a moment because the text speaks so clearly to the time when I was a football superstar <laughs> in high school playing for the Plano Wildcats. And we, we actually set records my first year on varsity. Uh, first time Plano had never won a game. And it was, so I'm in the record books. And I had, a, I had a rough relationship with my coach. He had a nickname for me. Most of the coaches called me Fortney because that's my last name. But he called me freelancer because I did my own thing. And like he would call plays and I would see stuff and be like, well, I'm gonna change things. And I wasn't the quarterback. I was either just a defensive back or an H back. And so I wasn't in the position to be calling shots, but I knew better than him. So I would not necessarily do what he said. And because of that, I was unable to submit to his authority and that impacted the way I was able to play on the field. Uh, and it probably contributed to the fact that we didn't win any games that season because I was not running the player supposed to run because I thought I had a better play. And it, it paid off, like 20% of the time I had a better idea than him. And so I had a hard time submitting to him. But as we dive into 1 Peter, we're gonna be looking at that word submit, giving yourself to someone else's control, someone else's authority and how hard that is for us, whether we're a hot-headed high schooler or a cool-headed middle-aged person, wherever we find it's still difficult. Being in 1 Peter, remember, this is our overarching umbrella statement. It's that as God's chosen people, believers are called to endure suffering with hope, following in the footsteps of Christ, trusting that their trials serve to sanctify them and prepare them for the glory to come. That's the heading for all of First, he First Peter, but it's also like a summary of everything we're gonna cover today. And if you've got your chart, if you don't have one of these, we've got some still at the tables uh, and it's available in our app online. We give you these tools because we want all of us to be fully devoted disciples, followers of Jesus. And that means studying his word. And this chart helps us divide his word into bits that we can understand. And we're moving, we're transitioning from the identity of God's people into the responsibilities of God's people. Specifically, we're gonna be covering that, that section that's Christ-like living today. What does it look like to live like Christ? So we're going from who you are to how you behave. And I will take just a brief minute to, to tell you we're gonna cover a lot today. Every time I read through the message and I get to the end of a section, I think, man, that's a full sermon. And then I go to the next page and there's still more sermon to have. Um, so the Greek word for a lot is a lot. <laughs> but we're gonna double down. And that's, it's so important because we have limited time together to dive through the text. It's not my job to chew your food for you, but it's my hope that I would deliver a word that God has for us as a church through his text and we grow most when we absorb it together, but when we study it on our own, when we can glean what the Spirit is teaching us and what God's Word is teaching us through His Spirit, together we can grow together. 
And it's my hope that as we, as we dig through a lot today, that we are going to see some things that we're called to do good. And doing good is a big part of our mission here on earth. And part of that doing good means for the sake of Christ, we're on a mission through submission. And we're going to submit in the world around non-Christians. We're going to submit in the world under the government. We're going to submit at home servants to unbelieving masters or bad leaders and wives and husbands. What does that submission look like? So even just looking at that summary, you can probably see there's some landmines that have been spread out for me. And I'm going to do my best to step firmly on each one of them as it pertains to the text. Uh, And we'll put an email on the screen that someone will follow up if you've got questions, concerns. I've said the word submission, and before we read the text, I want us to hear the definition of that word so that when we hear it, when we apply it, we know what that means. Because the church historically has not done well with this word. In America, that that word isn't necessarily a friendly word. In in progressive Christianity, that word is kind of nixed because we're all equal all the time. But the, the word submission, hippotasso, means to willingly place yourself under the authority of someone else. Submission is a willingness to place myself under the authority of someone else. And in that submission, we're gonna see it's a blessing. It blesses others when we submit. It blesses us when we submit. And it blesses the leaders we're submitting to when we submit. And he gives us a clear call and an order to the submission we have. So let's dive in to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So this, we're just going to take bite-sized chunks out of the next 60 verses together. And this one, he basically lines up, remember who you are as sojourners. Remember who you are. Remember where you are as exiles. So you're not around a bunch of uh, other Christians all the time. You're not necessarily in a place that's encouraging your faith to be lived out and practice. And remember who you're around. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, among people who don't follow Jesus, people who don't believe in God, people who aren't chosen, aren't a part of it. Remember who you're around. And as you're around them, consider how you behave. Consider how you honor them. So this first part is submitting in the world. Submit in the world. If our mission is submission, we're going to submit around non-Christians. And the first part of that submission is waging war against sins of the flesh. Waging war against things that are going to draw us off sides so that we look just like everyone else who doesn't believe in Jesus, who doesn't follow Jesus. We have to submit in the world by following Jesus first and foremost. Because if we're submitting in the world to the non-believers, to the the rules and things that are going to draw us into sin, then we aren't really honoring unbelievers. We aren't really honoring Jesus, and we aren't really honoring each other. So we have to submit around non-believers in an honorable way. We need to show them honor. I think we get caught up in just thinking we're right because we believe in the truth, the big T truth, and so we treat others like they're wrong in a non-honoring way. And that's not very loving. That's not what we're called to do. He says, don't give, don't give them a footing. So when they speak about you, don't give them ill things to say. Just live in a way that honors God and honors them so that when they speak about you, they can only say the good things that you've done. Even if you're in Rome under the authority of Nero, who is not friendly towards Christians, Google him. Even if you're in oppressive times or submitting to a dictator, our culture is not as bad as maybe it was when Peter was writing this letter. But also our culture is not as bad as it's gonna get. So we're kind of in this in-between of, this is probably as easy as it's ever gonna get to honor others and follow Jesus. And so in that ease, we got to tighten up and see what is my behavior showing others? My internal reflection is what would it look like if we were known as Christians by our positives instead of by the loud minority of Christians who aren't honoring non-believers, who aren't honoring the Lord with their actions? But what would it look like if the world was filled with Christians who were living in a way that honors others for the sake of of Christ. 
in the way that chooses to lay down necessarily my loud preference and make it a little quieter, not so that I can prove that I'm right, but so that I can love someone else and honor them. This plays out beautifully in the different types of media we have. We have social media, we have news media. It's, it's beautiful. We could just watch things unfold the way people honor or dishonor each other simply by clicking a like button or a ha-ha button or a care button or the way we comment on other people's posts. If you weren't here last week, uh, Lev was pretty clear, get off social media. But if you didn't listen and you're still on social media, like, like I am, you got to see a lot of things play out on social media over the last 96 to 100 hours as people all voiced their feelings and opinions in response to the election, in response to sports, in response to just life. And then you go a level deeper and you see how people respond to people responding in their time of whatever they're feeling. And I've seen Christians fail terribly at showing honor to people they disagree with people who aren't following Jesus. We just choose to belittle, to knock down. We kind of, we have this mindset as a church, when we say we wanna engage our city, we wanna engage our city in a way that if for some reason, we had to close our doors and get out of town, the city would be distraught by that. The people who don't follow Jesus, but the people who live in and around Collin County and in Plano, they, they would be impacted negatively by us leaving. But our culture, typically when they see a church is getting put up somewhere in their neighborhood, most of them aren't responding with, oh, yay, a church, this will be great. People often think, okay, here comes the, the push for fundraising, here comes the hypocrites, here comes the door knocking, here comes the people that are telling me the sign in my yard is wrong or the way I behave is wrong. What if we instead had a positive reputation? And as a church, we wanna have that as a positive reputation, our witness The way we live, the the things people see should be honoring to them for the sake of Jesus. Not so that people would be like, man, I like City Bridge. I want to get one of those shirts. But so they would say like, what's up with those guys? I've met Christians before, but the ones at City Bridge, they, they seem to actually love me. They seem to actually see a need and then pursue meeting that need in a way that would honor the God that they worship. It's sad that that's an abnormal thing for churches to do, but we are striving to, for the sake of Jesus, submit under the authority we have to follow him and honor others. Our actions and words are representing more than we even realize. Back to me being a high school football superstar. I never went pro for religious reasons. (laughs) But I would... I would make some good plays every now and again, if you can believe it, this part's not a lie. Like I would make some big plays and then I would start jawing at the guy that I just tackled. Or when I'd bat a ball down, I'd look at the quarterback and I'd say, try again, try again. And I'd just do stupid things. And my coach who didn't love the fact that I was on the team, he would get mad at me (laughs) and he would say, hey, remember the way you behave on the field, in between plays, on the sideline, the way you behave, you're representing the name on the front of your jersey. So if people watch you and they think, man, the Plano Wildcats are tools. They're they're classless. They're not good sportsmen. You're representing my team, Josh. And that's not what my team is standing for, which led to me standing on the sideline. But then my dad picks me up after the game from the locker room. He says, hey, yeah, the front of your jersey matters. You're representing them, but there's a name on the back of your jersey too. You're representing my family. That's not how Fortneys behave. Act like you've done something positive before, not like you surprise every time you do something right. Your actions represent the team you're playing for and the family you're a part of. That's basically what Peter is saying is your actions around Gentiles stand for your belonging, your identity as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. And then Peter steals some words from Jesus, which I think Jesus was okay with because Peter couldn't say it better himself. He says, uh, basically, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Like, hey, they should see what you're doing and they should glorify God. This is my daughter's life verse. I, I pray it over her, I speak it over her. She's working on memorizing it still because her name means light and I want her to be a light, a light that shines bright of God's favor on others. 
And it's a lot of pressure to put on an eight-year-old, but it's not my pressure, it's the word of God. I'm just asking her to live up to the beauty that we have of let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. So that's Peter's first chunk. He's saying, hey, if you're submitting, then that means you're living in a way that honors Jesus and honors others. Now we're gonna jump into a section about the government. So I hope your seatbelt's fastened. Verse 13 Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter packs a punch here. He's supposed to submit in the world. Our mission of submission is submitting in the world to the government. And he says, honor the emperors. The last thing he says, Nero, the guy that's killing Christians down in Rome, using them as torches and blaming them for burning the whole city down. Honor him in the way you live. Be subject to, submit to the human institution of leadership because God has placed it over you. Our country has not excelled at this as mentioned in our response to the election, as mentioned in the fact that we even are a country. Like the whole reason that we're a country is because we didn't like the king and so we declared to be independent against that country. Our country was founded on a lack of submission to bad authority. But now we'll get better at submission, I think. Now I think we've got an opportunity to consider, okay, we're, we're not under the king, but we are under the president. We are under the legislative branch. We are under the judicial branch, the executive branch. What does it look like for me to be subject to them, even if maybe there's a politician out there in authority who doesn't support what you stand for, if that's possible? What would it look like to be subject to them? For me to hold faithfully to my convictions and to stand for what is right, but in a way that honors the person I disagree with? Or am I just gonna badmouth them using every mechanism I can? Am I gonna uprise and storm? Am I gonna throw pity parties and fits on social media? For the sake of Christ, the way we respond to the government, whether we agree with them or not, is something that they're gonna see like, okay, what are Christians doing in response to the election? What are Christians doing in response to this legislation? What are Christians doing in response to this need in the world? We as a church wanna be marked by a positive response to things whether they're legislated or not. That's why we we have a clinic, because we wanted to step in and say, all right, healthcare in this country is what it is and there are people who don't have access to it, so we wanna make sure that we're supporting people in a way that we can. So let's direct attention into meeting healthcare medical needs in this community. That's why we have Regen. There are people in this community who are outcasts and have nowhere to confess the deepest, darkest things they're wrestling with. And we say, no, like, come in here. It's normal, actually. You're not alone. Let's dig in together. We're, we're not necessarily saying we're not concerned with what legislation is. We're not saying we don't care who the governor is or who the president is. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that we need our actions for the sake of Christ to honor those people and their authority. And we can use our voice to speak up when things are wrong. But when we take matters into our own hands, are we doing it in a way that's going to honor Jesus? Or do we feel like our way is better? The way I respond to politics is sometimes the way I respond to Coach Brent's. It's like, no, I've got a better idea. And I think God would want me to do this even though it doesn't necessarily align with scripture. Even though it's unloving or unkind or dishonorable, I need to do it because my way's right. We have to take a step back and submit and humble ourselves for the sake of Christ. Submitting to the government on the other end is not praising them. If we think the result of the election is going to fix all of our problems and finally give us hope and finally save us, we're gonna be so disappointed. 
Even if every politician did everything the way we wanted it to do, no man other than Jesus can carry the weight of our hope and salvation. And Peter reminded us that we have a living hope in Jesus. There are not many living presidents right now. Jimmy Carter's hanging on. He's setting world records for hospice care. Like he's not going anywhere, except he will die one day and we'll be sad and we respect his, his leadership for his season. But all the presidents before him and some of the presidents after him, they're gone already. So we can't put our hope in FDR. We can't put our hope in JFK. We have to put our hope in Jesus. He's the only one that can carry the weight of it. And hoping in Jesus and submitting to the president can happen at the same time. Because the president can change the law, but he can't change my hope. He can change the rules, but he can't change my future. But I can follow the rules. I can speak positively about him where I can speak positively about him. I don't have to disrespect him or put him down. I can bring fame to Jesus' name instead. And then Peter gives us a summary, a way to catch our breath. And we're almost to, toward the first 20% of this message. He gives us four quick hits. He says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. It's almost like, all right, let's catch our breath here. I wanted to write three paragraphs about each one. So instead, I'll just say, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. He's summarizing everything. Honor, love, fear, honor, love, fear. These four little phrases, they speak so highly, all for the sake of Christ. I'm not honoring the emperor so that people would see I'm a good citizen of Rome. I'm doing it so they would see Christians respond to things that don't go their way in a way that displays their trust in God and their call to love their neighbor as their selves. This is the second most important thing Jesus said. So how do we honor and love people who believe and behave differently, for, differently than us? The most humbling thing I can do for someone that I disagree with don't like, don't necessarily outwardly respect, the most humbling thing I can do is pray for them. And if, if the guy or gal you voted for did not win or did win, have you prayed for them? If the person you work with that drives you crazy is still driving you crazy, have you, have you prayed for them? It's such a cop-out thing for a pastor to get up here and say, pray for your enemies, but that's not my idea. <laughs> Jesus said that, so give him credit for that. But lifting up someone who doesn't love Jesus to the Father in heaven who loves them even more than we could ever love them ourselves really humbles us. It levels the playing field for me to say like, God, this person drives me crazy and I don't know why you wired them that way, but would you fix them? That's not the prayer. The prayer is, God, there's, so there's something not clicking here and I know the heart of it is that they don't follow you. The heart of it is that maybe I am entrenched in my sin and I'm not following you, or maybe you're trying to sharpen and sanctify me. But when we pray for people who don't believe in Jesus or people who don't align with what we believe, we are submitting ourselves under God's plan, will, and authority for them and for us and for this world. This is a gift. The second way that we can honor is to love selflessly. If you can show love, people can see love. People can't see the fact that I'm praying for them unless I comment thoughts and prayers, and then they can kind of see that I'm praying for them, or at least that I typed it, but people can see that I love them. People can see our actions. Peter says, Jesus said, let them see your good works and not think, well, Josh, he's just great. I saw him do this thing. But see your good works and glorify your Father is in heaven. Glorify God on the day of visitation. If they would see the way that we love, they'd begin to wonder, like, how are they so loving? They have to deal with the same junk I have to deal with. They have to deal with the same hardship. They have to work for the same boss, be under the same government. Why are they handling it so differently? Well, it's because my hope's not in that. Because my love is not for them to be like me. My love is for them to give their lives to Jesus so that they may be with me in eternity. And that's a humbling thing. And the last thing is to be kind always. A kind action speaks louder and longer than a thousand words. If all we're doing is hollering and shouting, people are going to miss the loving aspect of our faith. If all we're doing is loving and not telling people it's because we follow Jesus, they're missing out on the substance of our faith. And so we got to love so loud and we got to tell people why we're choosing to honor them, why in our disagreement we're still leaning in and being for them. 
It's because we had someone lean in and be for us and die on the cross for us. So love, honor everyone, even the emperor. We still have more. Verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. What credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So the submitting to my master is this next section. Servants, be subject to your masters. And he's speaking literally to servants, to slaves. And the, the way servanthood was back then, there were some who entered in willingly to servanthood because they had to pay a debt because they owed someone something or because they couldn't care for themselves and they knew, at least as a servant, I'll be cared for. Uh, And then there were some that were placed in servitude. They were captured as servants. They were forced to be servants because of war, because of family status, because of geography. So be servants. So some chose and some were not chosen. But we have kind of a similar thing here in Texas. We, We have some people who have chosen employment, and we have some people who are put in a place they don't want to be, but they still have to be bound to that master, whether that's incarceration, whether that's just being placed in a season of owing and having to do things beyond what you want to do with your time to pay back. Servants, be subject to your masters. We don't have to endure slavery like the people that Peter is writing to had to endure. We we ruined slavery as a country and it should have been taken care of before it even got here if if our founding fathers believed the word like they said they did. But today we can still see this subject applying to our lives because he says, be subject to your masters with all respect. So my master today I can consider is my boss. Could be ministry leaders or elders. It could be the coach of my child's team and in putting my child's care under that coachship. Could be the president of the PTA. Could be the president of the HOA. It could be the the club that I'm in, the country club I go to. There are so many masters that we willingly submit to. We're, as a state, we're an at-will state. So every job you get, you're willingly choosing to work there and they can willingly keep you as long as they want or willingly get rid of you whenever they want. We aren't dehumanized. Many of us are paid and treated better than slaves, but still, submission, when we submit, this first part of submitting at home comes to servants are submitting to unbelieving masters or harsh rulers or mean bosses, whatever that looks like. And this lesson gets more and more applicable and important the further we go in the alphabet of generations. So my grandfather, he was born in 1914. I think he probably got his job, his first job in 1915. And then I think he enlisted in the war in 1916. Like it was just ingrained in him. I will always have to work. I will always have to follow someone's leadership. I'll have to submit. And so that whole generation, they called them the greatest generation for obvious reasons, they knew what what it meant to submit to leaders and to do your job even when it was hard. When he had to do difficult things, he did them because he had to do them. Whether it was his commanding officer telling him, whether it was the director of sales at uh, Caterpillar and Holt Brothers telling him, he had to do things even when they were hard. And then my parents' generation kind of the same thing. Like, I don't want to have to work as much as my parents, but I know I have to work hard. And so I've seen my parents work hard. I've seen them work for bad bosses. I've seen them work long hours because they needed to do that for the sake of the team because they didn't want to dishonor their boss or their company. And then all of a sudden, my generation rolls around. I'm a very, very young millennial, we could say. And we feel like we deserve PTO more often than we should. We feel like we deserve to work from home so we can kind of flex on when we're working and when we're not. We feel like we deserve to leave work at a decent hour, like two or three, four. And then there's a generation after mine. We'll call them Gen Z. 
I'm, I'm on the cusp of millennial Gen Z, even more so entitled, even more self-deserving. And we just feel like we deserve, we've earned, and not thinking through how am I honoring God in the way that I work, but more so God has put me in this place as a blessing to these people, they're lucky to have me. That mindset is not a submissive mindset. That mindset's filled with pride. Like, I'm so glad I'm here to solve all your problems, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be done when I'm gonna be done. So don't you worry about my timesheet or my work ethic. That's even easier to do when you have a bad boss. Like, my boss is unruly. My boss is unkind. My boss has poor communication, is always late. My boss does not lead as well as I would if I were the boss. My boss doesn't relate to people as well as I would if I were the boss. And again, we, we ditch submission quickly. And we think, okay, my way is better. And now all of a sudden we have these bosses who are thinking, oh, I've got this option to hire someone who seems really outward in their faith. They seem to really follow Jesus. But what I know is that they're probably not gonna work very hard. Or someone who has this just uber work ethic and has proven to work hard, they're gonna hire the person that worked hard. And I think the opposite should happen, that instead Christians should be the ones that work hard. Because scripture is riddled with this reminder that we need to work hard as if working for the Lord and not men. We need to submit to our bosses in a way that allows us to work hard for them. Showing healthy submission so that we would actually be the model instead of the exception. That we would be the good employees instead of the employees that are like, well, that person voted this way, so I'm not gonna do what they say. Or I saw that person post this on social media, so I don't have to follow them. We're the first to withhold grace. My boss was late, so I guess I'm gonna be late whenever I want. That meeting went long, so I'm gonna leave early. And we're trying to make things right by our standards instead of submitting and saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. The Lord has called me to work under your authority, but not under your lordship. So I'm going to submit to your authority because of the lordship that I have in Jesus Christ. This is a gracious thing to do, is what Peter says. He says, what, what good is it if you do something wrong and you're punished for it and you deal with the punishment? That's called common sense. That makes perfect sense, that's right. What good is it? What good is it if you don't do anything wrong, you're punished for it and you endure? That speaks loudly. That's a gracious thing. Peter actually stole this concept again from, spoiler alert, Jesus himself. Peter was with Jesus, he heard Jesus' teaching, he saw Jesus, and Jesus said in, in Luke chapter six in the Sermon on the Plain, basically like, hey, love your enemies. Like, don't... Don't just do good to those who do good and do bad to those who do bad, but do good towards those who are your enemies. Be merciful even as your father is merciful, as he says in Luke 6. This concept is at the core of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. If Jesus came just to save those that were righteous, heaven would be empty. But instead, he came to save his very enemies. He came to die for the ungodly. And Peter stealing these things from Jesus because he saw that this is real, this is legit. It says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but as servants of God. Colossians 3, Titus 2, Philippians 2, all these things say, hey, the way you speak, the way you pray, the way you act should all honor God in your work. So be subject to your masters. And at the same time, if you think your job is going to be the solution to everything, just like you thought your governor was gonna be the solution to everything, you're going to be disappointed. Your job won't and is never meant to be everything you want it to be. It's a calling, it's a station, it's for a season. And if we can honor for whatever that season looks like, however long it is, I think our actions will speak loudly about the goodness of Jesus and the way he's changed our lives. And he's given us an example. If we look to verse 21, for to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten 
but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the most perfect, beautiful example of submission. And it took God himself coming in flesh to show us what submission looks like as he responded to authority, as he responded to people. Our our typical response whenever things go wrong is we're going to rebel against rule changes. We're gonna fight back and do our own thing. We're gonna bad mouth the rule and policy. We're gonna, our way is better, so I'm gonna stand up for this. But Jesus set us a different example, a Christ-like response to submitting to the shepherd and overseer. He was mocked and he was rejected and he was reviled, but he didn't revile in return. He was beaten, he was spit on, but he didn't beat back. He didn't spit back. He turned the other cheek because he knew the mission. He knew the end of the story. He knew what was coming. He he battled in the Garden of Gethsemane. He he said, I God, if if there's another way, can we do that? But it's not my will, it's your will be done. And so for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He set his face like flint towards what was coming for him, and he submitted, setting the perfect example for us. He humbled himself and became obedient to the cross. He remained silent as he was beaten and mocked. There's a lot in this part, but we can see his example of what did Jesus do when he was faced with authority in the government? He says, hey, do what the government says. My face isn't on that coin. So that's Caesar, give it back to Caesar. When he saw people who were working for bad bosses, he says, what, what are you going to do? And he told stories and parables that modeled where, what does it look like for me to follow a bad boss? Because at the end of the day, I'm not the judge of my boss. I'm not responsible for my boss's behavior. I'm gonna trust the one who judges justly. So for the season here, I'm going to submit to my boss. And then when it comes to, well, there are new jobs popping up all over. I just keep my LinkedIn as open to work and my Indeed just repopulates jobs all the time. So if I don't like you, I can go over here. And if I don't like you, I can go over here. Jesus could have left earth a whole lot earlier. And we're not Jesus. But I think if we get somewhere and we stay somewhere and we are somewhere and we plant there, our witness is gonna grow. Our reputation is going to exceed what we meant it to be. Our staying power grows, not so that we can grow our income or our reputation, but people know who we are and what we stand for instead of having to start over every three years because you wanted a different boss or a different job or a different thing. I think if more Christians stayed in their job for the sake of honoring Jesus, even under a bad boss, even amidst all unbelievers that you work with, I only work with people who don't follow Jesus. Well, I wonder if the Lord decided to put a light in that dark place so that they may see your good works and glorify the God that you are telling them about all the time through the way you act and the things that you do. Jesus came and he showed us how to live a perfect life. And he didn't say, you guys aren't perfect, you're not doing it right. He instead died for us so that we might have a chance to go in to be with him for eternal life. And that might becomes a will when we confess Jesus as our Lord and we recognize that we're sinners and we repent from that sin to follow him. He set the perfect example. We're gonna come back to that, but I wanna cover another mind, another section of scripture. As we get into chapter three, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of of a gentle and quiet spirit, 
which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. This is another big one. Submit at home. Wives, submit to your husbands. Again, this doesn't denote a value or dignity. This isn't about better than, worse than. This isn't more or less. This is God's design for the family. God has put the accountability and leadership for the family on the husband. And Peter's reminding them, wives, submit to your husbands. And just saying that is so countercultural in 2024 in the United States of America. But it's God's design and it's the very word of God that we would follow it. So I want to dig in a little bit, since we don't have any time, to at least cover it and say, what does it look like? What does it look like for me to submit to my husband? And I'll admit, like, I'm not a woman and I'll never be a wife. And I still believe this. And I believe that God has given me this opportunity to remind us about what scripture is telling us to do. Wives, submitting to your husband's leadership, it can look like graciously coming under his imperfect leadership, whether he's a Christian or not recognizing that he's not perfect, but I have an opportunity to be gracious toward him and recognize that he's not perfect, but instead of calling out every imperfection, instead I can lift him up. If your hope is for this ideal Christian husband and that he would solve all your problems, again, you'll be disappointed. He's not Jesus. Let Jesus be Jesus. Let your husband be your husband. And he's not right all the time, but you can win him over through the way that you submit and follow and point him to Jesus. The second way that you could submit is build him up instead of tearing him down. That quiet, gentle spirit is a word of encouragement, a word of affirmation. I think there's too much uh, putting each other down in marriage. And we're going to cover this for several weeks in January and February. But when we can build up Wives, if you build your husband up, just a little bit of encouragement, it changes his entire perspective. I say this as a husband. I'm not a words of affirmation guy, but I know just a little bit of encouragement reminds me like, oh, I'm lucky to have a lovely wife. But also I have an opportunity to make an impact on my family through the way that I lead. But I think there's too much in this culture of you'll never believe what my husband did and he's leaving his shoes all over the floor and we're just beating our husbands down. And there's a beaten husband club. When women, wives, if you speak positively about your husband to him and to others about him, your conduct will win him over and remind him of the grace of God, trusting the Lord when his leadership looks different than yours. It doesn't look like, uh, how am I going to dress to impress him? How am I going to adorn myself? It looks like, how am I going to follow Jesus by following my husband. If you find yourself stuck and and you're not sure if you have a uh, destructive marriage or not, we want to be a resource. We want to help you evaluate. We want to point you towards Jesus and and come alongside you. We've got an email address on the screen, pastoralcare at citybridgechurch.org, if you want to talk more about that. Again, we're going to talk about marriage through January and February. We're going to cover a lot. But men, I don't want to leave you guys out because men have become passive Men have sat on the sidelines. We're to blame for the TV model dad and model husband who's aloof, who's goofy, who's a a doofus, who's lazy. But here's what Peter would say and scripture would say about what our role looks like in the beautiful design. He says, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Likewise. So as your wife submits to Jesus, or as your wife submits to you for the sake of Jesus, as you submit to your boss for the sake of Jesus, as you submit to the government for the sake of Jesus, as you honor non-believers around you for the sake of Jesus, likewise, the same reason, live with your wife in an understanding way, because if you don't, it will hinder your faith. This is a radical call. Just like everyone else is submitting to Jesus, you should lead out in submitting to Jesus. And if you don't, your relationship with the Lord will be hindered. Your prayers won't be heard. Your time with the Lord will feel dry and stale. So am I living with my wife in an understanding way by my standards? Which looks like, well, I I show honor to her in the way we engage in physical touch. That's got to be what she wants. 
in the way that I let her sit next to me while we watch football, or she can drive the golf cart while we go golfing. She'd love that. The way I encourage her by giving her a hug, even though she's a words of affirmation gal. The way I say thank you for buying the groceries sometimes when I say that. Or am I showing honor in the way that she would receive and feel truly honored by considering her, by reminding her that I love her and there's a father in heaven who loves her perfectly and by knowing her. And if I don't know how to do that, Peter just said we have an example in Jesus who showed us how to do that. And his example was, hey, they're gonna do bad things to me, I'm gonna continue to love them. They're gonna say bad things to me, I'm gonna continue to point them to my Father in heaven. They're not worthy of what I have to offer them, I'm gonna offer it anyway. And so this is why every so often we, we close our service with communion. And we take time to remember what Jesus did, even though we didn't deserve it. To remember what Jesus did, even though we don't honor others, even though we don't honor him, he continually, while we were still sinners, he died for us. And so that's what we're gonna do to close out this morning. In a minute, the band's gonna come out and we're gonna worship, but before we do that, we have to remember who we are, like Peter starts his letter, and how we respond, like Peter jumps into this section, by Christ-like living. But if we say we're without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from any unrighteousness. And we do that by recognizing I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, hey, sinners. He was, he was with his followers on the night that he was gonna be betrayed and sent to the cross. And, and he broke the bread and he gave thanks to God for the bread. And he said, hey, this bread's a new covenant that I'm making. It's gonna be broken for you. And so he said, when you eat the bread, remember me. And for Christians, if you follow Jesus, if you claim his, him as Lord, he invites you to partake of this. If you're not a Christian, there's nothing special about this. I would just save yourself the effort of trying to open the cup or having to deal with this cracker. But for Christians, there's something sweet about the fact that Jesus endured the cross for me and has invited me in to participate in honoring others. So he broke the bread. He said, my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the body. And after they ate, he had the cup and he gave thanks and he blessed it. He poured some on the ground. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood not the blood of a lamb, not the blood of a sacrifice, other than me, my blood. Jesus said, my blood will be shed for you so that you may be made new, brand new. So let's do this in remembrance of him. We're gonna continue to journey through 1 Peter and there's so much more to cover. But the act of remembering Jesus in everything we do is the act of submitting to his lordship first and foremost and letting everything flow from that. Let's pray. God, you're good. We thank you for being over time as we've used it. We thank you for speaking to us through your word. And would you continue to help us apply your word in the way that you convict us, in the way you encourage us, in the way that you draw us to follow you in hard relationships, in the way you draw us to follow you in the submission that we have to engage in. And Lord, we trust you. Would you help us to trust you with bad bosses, with difficult governments, with difficult spouses? Would we instead lean heavily on you as the source of all the honor we can draw and give to someone else and all the love we can show? God, be with us as we seek to follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.